So guys, let's get started. Um, I came to Mexico about two years ago and I really had no idea about Ricea. I, I knew about tequila, I knew about mezcal um, pretty, pretty well, you know, just like a good foundation. Um, but when I, when I moved to Jalisco, I discovered this spirit called Ricea. And right now I'm in Puerto Vallarta and everybody um, talks about this here. When, when they find out that I'm a mezcal drinker or I'm a tequila drinker, the people here actually reference Ricea more than they reference any other kind of alcohol. Um, and that's because most producers are within a three to four hour um, driving distance from here. So, you know, it, you're, you're exposed to a lot of different types of Ricea. Some are amazing, some are good. And you also have the, you know, uh, the Ricea's that are not so good as well. But anyway, we're going to cover everything. And um, I'm calling this the Ricea reports because I'm just reporting on what I found over the last two years. Um, the, the subtitle is A Closer Look at the Jalisciense uh, Agave Spirit. And, uh, you know, when, when people think of tequila, like it, it, it eclipses all other agave spirits, right? And the, the, the market share that tequila has over, over Bacanora, Mezcal, Ricea, Soto it, is crazy. However, with, with Mezcal and with Ricea, they're, they're catching up now, you know, like um, I'm not saying that it's going to be equivalent at any time soon or anything like that, but you definitely see some movement, which is awesome. Um, not, not just like, uh, you know, definitely among the locals, but also with um, also international, we're getting a lot of international attention. There's, there's a couple of different um, spirits exhibits. In, in Mexico throughout the year, like trade shows where people from around the world come to Mexico and they try all these different great agave spirits. So anyway, um, my name is Greg Rutkowski and I'm the president of Mezcal for Life. Uh, we, we basically sell handicrafts um, in the United States, Mexican handicrafts, copitas, um, jicaras, different things to drink your mezcal out of. We don't sell this, but this is super cool. It's it's a uh, black clay copita that an artisan decided to use um, black light paint, and it looks super cool in the dark. And uh, I don't know, we might bring these on soon just to to show off in some bars because this looks super cool at night. But anyway, let's get started. Um, you can see my contact information down in the left hand corner. You could email me at info at Mezcal for Life, and then there's my phone number too. So just a little bit of housekeeping. If you guys could please keep the comments clean. Um, also to come, come to this with like an open mind, like there's no hard and fast rules for anything Mezcal and Ricea related. Um, Maybe, maybe tequila, everything's kind of more in a box, but I feel like when we're talking about kind of the more artisanal ancestral agave spirits, you really have to be um, open-minded when you approach things. Like uh, there's exceptions to every rule. Um, another thing I wanted to say is I don't consider myself a Ricea expert. Um, I have been studying it the last two years and I've made a lot of, a lot of friends in, this, in the Ricea space. Um, but I don't, I don't consider my, like, I, I don't want to say that I'm an expert in any way. I'm just reporting on what I've found over the last two years. So um, there might be a couple of Ricieros um, in the chat. If you are, you might want to just say, hi, hi, I'm a Ricieto. Uh, my name is Sergio or, uh, you know, Juan or something uh, from, from whatever brand you represent. Um, I know my friend Sergio from uh, Tesoro del Oeste said he was going to be joining us tonight. So hopefully he did. Now, um, in that left-hand corner, you can see Sergio cutting a really big agave maximiliana. Um, these things get pretty big, which is really, really cool. So uh, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Chicago. Uh, my grandmother was born in Guadalajara, just outside of Guadalajara. And she wound up marrying a, a Polish World War II refugee who immigrated to Mexico and lived here for about 10 years. So he, it was kind of funny because like, 
uh, when I was growing up, he identified more Mexican than he did Polish. And that's because he spent like the core childhood years in Mexico. Crazy story. Um, around 2016, I was reintroduced to Mezcal. Tequila and Mezcal were kind of like a part of like the, I guess, drinking culture in my family um, with my, my grandfather, my father and their friends and things like that. So I was kind of always around it, but it really didn't hit my radar until 2016. In 2019, I started Mezcal for Life because I saw that there was not a lot of um, not a lot of like copitas and jicaras available on the internet to buy to drink your mezcal out of. Um, there's a lot of different really cool drinking vessels, and uh, you know they're just they just weren't available at the time. Today, it's fast forward three years later, they're all over the internet now. Um, a lot of people decided to do the same thing, which is super cool. And I also see a lot of artisans selling their, their handicrafts on Etsy as well. So um, if you want, you could buy directly from the from a you know an artisan in an, an agave community online, which is super awesome. Um, let's see here. In 2021, I moved to Puerto Vallarta out of love and to pursue my agave spirit education. Um, about a year later, after I moved here. Uh, I started doing Ricea tours up to San Sebastian and back from Puerto Vallarta, which is about, I don't know, maybe like a four or five hour long tour. Um, but it's been really cool doing these private tours, getting people to show, uh, show them my world and things like that. So uh, let's see here. And then just, just last year, I became an, uh, an Agave Spirits advisor through the Agave Spirits Institute, ASI. And um they're, they're really, really cool. Like I was kind of skeptical in the beginning, but once I got uh, to talking to Daniel, the, the founder of the company, um, totally surprised at, I didn't realize like agave spirits education could be so deep. Um, and the, the, the courses that I went through are super th thorough. Um, it's great for bartenders, managers, anybody who's looking to get in the industry, even like somebody who wants to start their own brand. I think they teach, I think they even teach you how to start your own brand in the level four course. Um, but anyway, what I'm up to right now is I'm starting an agave spirits distillery in Puerto Vallarta called Finca 18 um, or Estate 18. And that's going to be open about two months. We're doing a soft open uh, at the end of February here. Okay, so let's get started. I'm just going to take a sip of water before we get going. Let me just open up the chat here, make sure everybody's doing good. Everybody doing good? <laughs> All right. So the first thing I want to do is talk a brief history about Ricea. Now, when we talk about Ricea, we also have to mention a lot of other agave spirits. And kind of in the uh, very beginning, things were... Things were referenced as vino de mezcal and other variations like that. And so here on the West Coast, during the, the Spanish colonization of Mexico, the Filipinos and the Chinese were also involved in trading with the, uh, on the West Coast near Colima. So that'll be the southern border of Jalisco. Now, the Filipinos are kind of famous in the Raicia world because they're the ones who brought this let me uh, show you guys. They're the, they're the ones who brought this wooden still. Now, this wooden still, it, it, it's kind of like a similar setup to a clay pot where you have a condenser up top, a copper condenser. You might have a clay pot on the bottom or, or copper, but then every, everything feeds out of this carrizo reed into the garrafon. So the Filipinos wound up bringing this to make uh, tapache or tuba which is a fermented coconut drink. Um, I think I've tried it once. There's still a little bit around. Um, and from what I remember, it was delicious. So during this time also, there, there's a few other kind of mezcals in Jalisco. Uh, we have tequila, but we also have Tutsi, Tushka, and Chocalo, along with Raicia. 
And it's kind of crazy just in Jalisco that there's there's five different kinds of, of agave distillates. Um, there's a really rich culture here of agave spirits. So um, each, each one has a few minor differences and we're gonna just touch on that a, a little bit. So as mezcal starts to spread to the West Coast, um, chocolo, chocolo is another type of small production mezcal um, local to Southern Jalisco, kind of near Colima, and they're using a Filipino steer, still here to make chocolo. And um, I think this really entrepreneurial guy just branded the name. Like it's actually, it would be like somebody branding mezcal, but but this guy's agave spirit is literally called uh, chocolo. So that it's super cool that he, that he wound up doing that, but he's kind of famous in the area as well. And you can see here, he's using a uh, a copper condenser, a wooden tree trunk. Usually they're made out of higuera, fig tree, or bonete. And it's feeding into a copper pot at the bottom. Um, something that's also interesting is Tutsi. Now this kind of blew my mind when I first heard about it. Um, in, in Jalisco and Nayarit, there's a, a population of indigenous people called the Huicholes or the Huixarica. And of course, they are also known as the peyote people, right? So they like once a year they do a big peyote ceremony. Um, it, you know, it's very special to them. Um, but also engraved in their culture, or, or I guess like a part of their culture rather, is tutsi, which is really a kind of mezcal. And uh, you can see this still here. It looks like a tank, right? We have the um, the pot, which is probably made out of clay surrounded by barro or also clay to keep the heat in, right? So we have the leña for the fire, firewood. And then we have this really long tube that goes through a open tree trunk and they feed the water here and they take the water out. Um, but this is what it condenses in and it's just kind of crazy. I've never seen anything like this in my life. Um, there's one brand that's actually distributing it right now in very limited quantities. Um, that's La Venenosa, Raicia. Um, I, I believe they just call it Tutsi. But yeah, this, this still blew my mind. Um, but they only make like so many liters per year and it's a very close community. So it's really hard to get. Anyway, so now that we have that covered, we want to talk about what is Raicia. So you can see on my map here, I have a red circle roughly around the area. And I say roughly because not all people have, have volunteered to be included in the de denomination of origin. Um, there, there's certain towns that are designated. The town decides, hey, we wanna be a part of this thing you guys have going on, which is the denomination of origin. We've been making Raicia for hundreds of years and uh, now we wanna be a part of it. But some people, don't care. Some people don't want to be a part of it. Some people can't afford it, which is unfortunate. Um, but this is kind of the rough line. So it, it covers basically all of, uh, I don't want to say all of Jalisco, but a lot of municipalities in Jalisco are considered um, denominations of origin, uh, a part of it anyway. Puerto Vallarta is a denomination of origin as well, um, a part of the Ricea Dio anyway which is really, really interesting to me because I don't know a single person who makes Raicia in Puerto Vallarta. So uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see. I'm getting a lot of cheddar. All right, guys, keep the comments clean, please. I don't think I should have to say that. Anyway, um, we want to talk about the name Raicia, like what's the origin, where did it come from? Now the origin of Raicia, um, the reason why they call it Raicia, it, it kind of translates to little root. And a lot of people say that they called it little root to avoid the authorities when um, there was kind of like a prohibition um, by the crown uh, um, on agave spirits. Every, you know, they wanted everybody in Mexico to drink um, alcohol from Europe. So in the beginning, Ricea was mainly used to basically keep the miners happy, right? We want to, 
we want to, I guess, maybe pacify the miners. So we're going to make a really strong agave spirit. Um, you know, that's the origin. You're going to see a lot of ricea in mezcal producing towns. Let's see here. One really interesting thing for me is that Jose Cuervo owned the name Raicia until the 1990s. And this is when I think either, I don't know if the trademark expired in Mexico or things just kind of transferred over to the denomination of origin, um, but they had control over the name Raicia, which is crazy. And, and most producers couldn't even call their, <laughs> their Raicia Raicia until, until about 2018 when it was official um, when the denomination of origin for Ricea started. Um, next is that Ricea distilleries are also known as tabernas. So let's talk a little bit about Ricea terroir. Now in Jalisco, we have the coast and we have the mountains and everything in between. There's lots of microclimates here. There's semi-desertic, um, coastal uplands, tropical lowlands. It is crazy, you know, how many different climates you could go through just in a couple hours. Um, we go from sea level, basically zero meters, up until 1,720 meters in altitude, which is crazy. Um, and and Ricea is produced everywhere in between. So if you think about it, it's going to be a very, very diverse flavor profile. Um, during the rainy season, we do have a really big rainy season here. August to November, basically everything shuts down. Um, this is when the Ricieros um, use this time to repair their, their taberna or do a second distillation on, on their ordinario or, or shishe. We call it ordinario here. I'm not even sure if I spelled that right, but that's what we call it. Um, during the dry season, a lot of producers plant right before it rains. Um, and we're harvesting agaves between January to August. A lot of people are starting to get start up right now or in the next week or two. So this is when Ricea production is in full swing. Um, a lot of people I, I hear write about Ricea, make videos about Ricea. I feel like they only try like one Ricea and, and give it a label. Like everybody says it's like funky tasting. Um, but if you try enough Ricea's, you're going to realize, hey, some of this um, tastes like, you know, a little bit maybe like mezcal, a little bit like tequila, too. There's, there's really no hard and fast rule of what Ricea actually tastes like. And it's, it's near impossible for me to explain to you what, what it tastes like. You just have to go out there and try as many as you can. So here's some of the landscapes. We have the mountains. You can see it's kind of dry. During the dry season, especially at the very end, everything is brown, 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 brown. And then when it rains during rainy season, it's the complete opposite. Everything's green. But during dry season, you'll see a lot of the times the mountains are, are basically on fire because everything's so dry. Um, here on the right, you have a picture of Agave Maximiliana. You can tell it's Maximiliana because it has these really small red tips and also kind of like a sword, like, uh, like a, a, an Arabian sword um, type, type of penka or agave leaf. On the bottom here, we have agave and gustafolia, which is also another like sword, like very straight penka. And you can see how big these, these pinas get. And then here's another shot of the mountains on the bottom right-hand corner. You can see how, how green it is versus the one in the top left corner. Um, so I'm just trying to like, you know, give you guys an idea of the terroir. There's two different kinds of ricea. There's the ricea from, from the Sierra or the mountains or the ricea from the coast. I don't know why there's not like a, an in-between ricea because there's ricea all the way from the mountain to the coast. So um, I kind of want to do away with this like myth that there's two, <coughs> sorry, that there's two different kinds of ricea because it's just simply not true. And, and, you know, everybody's trying to like make a, a name for themselves or, or label, you know, try to differentiate yourself, which I totally get. But, um, you know, there, there's Ricea all over Jalisco. So one thing I wanted to talk about is production process and why it's different than other processes in the agave spirits world. Um, 
we're gonna find we're gonna find some really you know keystone cornerstone things um don't worry guys if you guys have questions i'm gonna open up questions later at, at the very end i'm gonna save about a half hour to talk to you guys so types of ricea we have according to the do we have five different kinds we have maximiliana inequidens valenciana and gustafolia and rodecanta so it kind of goes in order here we have maximilian on the top left hand corner we have inequidens we have valencia second row we have in gustafolia and we have rodecanta now i put tequila in here and i put a shh and and that's because we're in we're in tequila country too. Everybody grows blue ever agave here, and and it's just because tequila is such such a big beast. And a lot of the agaveros make most of their money on blue ever agave, and it's really what's available here. So you'll often see a lot of uh, ricieros using tequiliana or blue ever agave in their agave distillates, but they can't call it ricea because it's not a part of the denomination of origin. So it's kind of it's kind of crazy to me that they're basically making tequila. They can't call it tequila, and they call they can't call it ricea either. So it's it's an interesting thing. Now, hopefully, my friend Sergio's in here. Let me. I think he might have messaged me real quick. I just want to make sure that he got in. It doesn't look like he can connect. But anyway, this is his taberna. Tesoro del Oeste. And you can see how the Orno looks like a big igloo. It's covered in, in white. I believe that's limestone, um, like a limestone dust they, they put around it to help seal the agave in. Um, oh, okay, great. It looks like Sergio's here. So this is his Orno. I believe it cooks around 2.5 tons of agave. Um, he might have dug it out on the bottom. Um, but the walls are a little bit less than a meter thick, maybe maybe 0.75 meters thick. Um, and, and the goal here is to really try to insulate, you know, the agaves, the fire, the heat. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you a couple other Ornos. The one on the left is a Taberna de Dangelo is his name. Well, it's the name of his, his distillery. Uh, the master distiller here is Luis. And he invented this like cool little Orno. Um, it's really cool because it's very ergonomic. You could pull the truck up at the top and just load the agaves in from the top here and get the fire going from the bottom. Now, you have to get these Ornos really, really hot. I've heard some people say 500 degrees. I've heard some people say 1,000. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the right temperature, and I'm not even sure the ricieros know the exact temperature. It's kind of based on feeling. So once they feel that the Orno is hot enough, which is usually red hot, you can see how hot it gets from these burn marks at the top. Um, that's when they, they might pull out any existing firewood in there just to stop the fire. You don't necessarily want a fire going, but you really want it hot. And they're going to load the agaves in the Orno as fast as they can because they don't want the agaves to catch fire. They want to keep everything insulated and covered too, as quick as possible. It's it's a really interesting thing to see um, wh when they're getting everything going. And then uh, we have another Orno here. And this is the Orno of Dan Lalo. Uh, the distillery is Dan Lalin. And it's, it's in La Estancia. It's the first distillery, actually, when you're heading up to the mountains from Puerto Vallarta. And he, he, he dug out his Orno at the bottom here, probably another meter or two. And you can see how thick the walls need to be as well, just to keep the heat in. This is a really interesting photo. Um, this was in La Estancia, which is in between Puerto Vallarta and San Sebastian, basically. And this is a Mamposteria Orno, which is an Orno made of rocks and cement. Um, it's said to be 100 or plus years old. Um, it's abandoned, but somebody found it on their property, I guess. So um, it's, co it's cool that we have remnants of really old distillations today.
sorry for the blurry picture here, but here's a Orno de Piedra. So this is a hole in the ground, basically. Some people line this with um, rocks. Some people line it with volcanic stone. I've even seen brick and I've seen cement. Um, basically, they're going to line this stone pit um, with firewood. Um, you know, same way they would with with the, uh, I guess, the conical shaped oven. And it's the same exact process, just reverse instead of a, a cone um, above ground, we have a cone below ground. You don't really see this too much in the mountains. You see this more in El Tuito or in the coast. And you can see here they're covering up and uh, very, this is a very, very small Orno. Um, I'm the, these guys' production must be incredibly small. Um, but you can see here, they're, they're getting everything sealed up. Another thing I wanted to talk about is milling. So there's really two different kinds of mills that ricieros use. And there's really, there's no rule to this, but you know, you don't see a lot of ta taonas. You don't see, um, you know, any other kind of mills, but this canoa here, which is a, um, basically a tree trunk. Um, some people just put some boards together and they crush the agave in this canoa. So this is a very labor intensive process. It takes hours and hours on end. Now, the other thing that a lot of ricieros use is this shredder. It's basically a machine shredder. And um, Don Lalo, this one on the right, uh, <laughs> I don't know if it's a John Deere or not, <laughs> but he, call, he calls his, his mill Juan, Juan Venado, which I thought it was hilarious. Um, I wouldn't say that ricieros are, you know, too proud to use these kind of machines. Um, however, the process for hand crushing the agaves is just so, so crazy and, and so strenuous that this really helps the process along. And, uh, you know, it, it said that it, the flavor Im impact is pretty minimal, but I can let you guys decide for yourself. Now we can talk a little bit about fermentation. Um, here's a steel tank. We have the agave fibers fermenting here. This is probably before a lot of water gets added or, or that's in the process of getting added here. We don't see too much liquid. Um, a lot of ricieros will use plastic. I've had a lot of good ricea from plastic. And so this is something that people will use Stainless steel is, I would, I would say, pretty famous. You can see on this bridge, this is Don Lalo's distillery. Um, this is the main road. You can see his distillery right off the highway. It's the first distillery. Um, he's got two setups, one kind of like down by the road more, which there's no question on what he does here when you're passing by. And then he's got one um, kind of more up high in the distillery area. Um, I can't exactly tell you how the stainless steel and plastic, and then also here the wood, this is a wooden vat, probably about 500 liters. Um, a lot of people use wooden vats, like if you have the money to afford one, um, they're a little bit harder to clean and maintain, but they're supposed to give you the best flavor. Um, with the plastic and the stainless steel, uh, those are much easier to clean, much easier to handle, maneuver, and things like that. One, one other interesting thing I've been seeing lately is clay pots for fermentation. And with clay pots, um, you know, I, I can't say this is a very, very common thing, but people are using it, especially in the south of Jalisco. And I know that there's also a distiller kind of near Sayulita. Um, I think his, his name, the brand's name is La Raicia La Estancia. Um, but he's making Raicia. Um, this might be in La Estancia, actually, but anyway, there, there are some clay pots going on, which is super cool. I haven't been able to try Ricea from a clay pot yet, but um, I'm definitely going to be on the hunt for it. I'm just going to take a little sip here. I'm a little parched. Wow, so this is the ensemble of, of three agaves. 
um, this one here from Tesoro del Oeste, Inequidens Maximiliana and Angustifolia. And this is really, really interesting because you don't really get to see a lot of ensemble. So um, there's a lot of awesome things going on here and I can't wait to try more of it. Um, we're gonna jump into distillation. This is probably the most, I would say the most interesting part. And you'll see a lot of different type, types of stills. <clears throat> Sorry guys, uh, a lot of different types of stills in Jalisco. We're gonna start with the Filipino still. I've showed you another example earlier. Um, this, is, this is a very small example of a still. We have the copper condenser up top, Carrizo Reed fed by fire and it drips down into the garrafon. Um, this is the uh, still from La Reina in Antinguil. And this is a basically a barrel, a wooden barrel. It condenses in copper, or sorry, we have a copper serpentine. I believe it's copper that feeds down here and condenses in this tank. So as you can imagine, the vapors just kind of like the smoke you see from, from the fire crawling up into the still and it gets captured in this tube. This tube is very, very small actually for, for what a serpentine um, usually is. And there could be a good reason behind it. Maybe it concentrates the flavors, but anyway, um, you just, this is something uh, Lobo uh, de la Sierra, he's another rice Sierra told me, he's like, imagine, imagine the vapors, you know, um, you're, you're starting to boil and you're, you're going through the still and then you're going through the condenser, like what, what's it all touching? You know, how, like, what's the shapes? You know, how, how is it touching the still? How is it being condensed? So it gets condensed in this tank full of cold water that you see on the left. And then it drips out at the bottom of the tank. Um, this is the, one of the most interesting contraptions I've ever seen um, from a Raisiero. Uh, this is the still from uh, Lobo de la Sierra, um, just outside of Mascota. Uh, you can see here, he condenses in steel tanks and the water comes out of here, but he's got two, you could get two different stills going at the same time, which is nice that they're close together so he could, you know, manage both. Um, from what I understood, he made this himself. You could see this is more triangular shape. Um, as he's imagining the vapors go through the still, he. He thought that triangle, the, the triangle shape would be the best um, shape for, for basically the head going into the serpentine, which is super cool. I like when people have really unique stories. Uh, Lobo's an awesome character. Um, here's another contraption by Lobo. Um, this still, I believe, is about 300 liters. And we have copper, we have a copper pot with a steel condenser. Uh, or a steel serpentine anyway. And this might be copper on the right-hand side that gets feed, fed through the water. So it's just really interesting to see. Next, we have a still from Sergio from Tesoro del Oeste. Um, he is in uh, San, Seb uh, San Sebastian del Oeste in the far back corner of the town. It's really cool. You, it's a San Sebastian del Oeste is a Pueblo Mexico. And as you're going to visit his taberna, uh, you get to see a old mining town um, back from the 1600s. Um, it looks like it hasn't changed since then. And, uh, you know, once you finally get to the very back of the town, you, you get to his taberna, um, which is super cool. Uh, you can see here that he's using uh, stainless steel. He's got two stainless steel um, stills fed by fire. Um, you might hear a lot of um, distillers talk about temperature control, and which is which is kind of interesting because a lot of people use fire to heat their stills. They use it as a heat source. I have seen some people use um, propane gas as well, and you know with propane gas you have so much more temperature control than you would with wood. Um, but you know these guys you know, learn from their grandfathers, learn from their fathers, or just really studied hard and figured out how to, maybe maybe through experience as well, done it enough times to keep the fire going at the right temperature. Um, they, they, they also say that during the first distillation, temperature is not as important as the second distillation. 
they usually try to, you know, I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people usually try to run the first distillation through the still as fast as possible. They call it a stripping run. Um, maybe, maybe the people uh, who have like higher quality might, might focus on temperature control from that first distillation too. Um, but you really can understand quality when, when we're talking about stills, because with this whole temperature control thing, you, you could really taste the difference between somebody who cares, like these guys I've showed you, La Reina, uh, Tesoro Del Oeste, Lobo, these guys really care um, when they're making their product, which is awesome. So another picture on the left here of uh, Sergio Severna. Um, you can see that he's got just kind of like a brick stand here, but everything's dripping out of this copper tube. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, maturation or aging. Um, Raiceros typically age their Raicea in um, these garrafones, these glass garrafones. Uh, they're actually really hard to get right now. All, all the mescaleros are fighting over them. Um, but these garrafones are really important because this is how the, the raicieros age their raicia. Um, it's called maduro in vidrio. And some people age, of course, you know, a lot differently than others. Like you might see somebody intentionally or un unintentionally age their um, raicia for two months. Or you might see somebody intentionally you know, keep their Ricea in glass um, for six months or longer. Um, and I've even seen some people bury their garrafones in the ground, which is interesting, you know, like when you're thinking about Jalisco and all these different climates, um, it's actually really hard to age things in barrels, um, especially if you're by the coast, it's a lot hotter um, down by the coast, but also um, even in the mountains, it's rather difficult to, um, find a good space, a temperature controlled room, a cave. There's really not, not too many caves if they, if they even exist um, and if people have access to them. But it's really interesting. Um, you know, I've, I have seen some people starting to barrel age. Um, you know, their rooms are small, though, so they, they can't really do it on a, on a big scale. Um, let's see here. Moving on to the next. Um, I know this photo is a little bit graphic, but this is the um, distillery of La Reina in Entenguil. And I haven't tried this yet, but they have been experimenting with a deer pechuga. Um, you can see that there's some tropical fruits with this deer pechuga. And basically they'll use, you know, different parts of the deer in, in the second or third distillation. Um, this isn't as common between ricieros. I, um, I actually, this is the first pachuga I've, I've heard of a ricieto make. I do want to see more ricieros make pachugas because I think they're very delicious, very savory. Um, and it's an, an awesome thing with tropical fruit here. We have so many different kinds of fruits available. So I want to see a lot more um, distillado con, like uh, distillations with different fruits, different, different local vegetables and different meat. So let's see how we're doing on time, 8.42. Other interesting notes are agave maximiliana can be only grown by seed. So we can't, we can't cut the hijuelo with these. Um, the only thing you can do is grow, grow them from seed, um, which, which comes, uh, you know, after after the agave matures, a quiote or a stalk shoots out of it and you could collect the seeds from that. Um, I think you might be able to, use to also use the bulbs um, from the quiote. You could probably replant those as well. But the main thing here is that you can't use ijuelos, which is very, very important. So with, if you think about it with Maximiliana, you're kind of getting a more wild agave every time you're drinking it, not like tequila when where everything is... is uh, Used with hijuelos, um, when you when you get that seed grown agave, uh, you get a kind of more natural spirit. Um, talking about wild agave, um, I've heard from a few ricieros that the the wild um, population of Maximiliana has basically been depleted. Um, the demand for ricea locally has significantly increased. 
especially in the last two years I've been here, it's crazy. Um, but also you see people starting to export ricea as well. So there's a lot of demand um, and it's depleting the wild population. Um, another thing that people are doing to kind of, I guess, offset that is they're, they're planting their own agaves. The ricearos will, I'm sorry guys, the, um, the ricearos will plant their own agave um, or, or convince the agaveros in the area to also plant Maximiliana with their Blue Weber. So another thing I wanted to note is that you do see a lot of, at least kind of toward the beginning of, of when Ricea was getting going, a, a lot of people like proofing down the Ricea. You see, I've seen it as low as 38, 40, 42. Um, and another really, really like, you know, when they do that, it, it's, for, it's for the local market. Like uh, I would say in general, Mexicanos aren't used to drinking super strong things like you know, uh, we're kind of used to really strong whiskey and scotch in the United States. However, um, the Ricieros are recognizing that palates are changing, their market's changing. Um, we're, we're going from a local market to an international market. And with that, the way that they're making their products are also changing. Um, for example, here, I have a Puntas from La Venenosa. Um, Lobo makes this Ricea, and this is um, 65 degrees ABV. There's a lot of demand for it, and it's really hard to, to get enough puntas to actually supply um, a brand. Um, but also Tesoro del Oeste, La Reina, and others are, um, you know, making Ricea 46%. Um, La, La, La Lobos signature Ricea, um, he, he likes it at about 45, 46% as well. So let's talk about my favorite subject. I own a drinkware company, so it's just natural of me to kind of point out the unique drinkware that um, is kind of famous for Ricea. And with that, I'm gonna take a little sip right now. Um, in, in Puerto Vallarta, we have a lot of tourists and in, in these uh, areas where like the, 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 the distilleries handle more tours, you might, you might get served Ricea out of a plastic shot glass. And, um, you know, it, when I see that, it's like, uh, you know, I'm not sure if they, they care or not, but to me, it kind of looks bad when you're just handing out these plastic shot glasses, but that's what they do. Um, also, you could see that there is these two really cool hand-blown glass. Uh, sorry, guys, I, I have a cat that just got sterilized and he's a little cranky right now. Um, this hand-blown glass here, there's a really ni nice bulb at the bottom to hold the spirits, but then there's a straight tube coming up and you can perfectly fit your nose and your mouth in this glass. I haven't been able to get these produced yet, but you know, um, I'm always on the search for really cool glassware. And this is definitely on my, my list. Um, you'll also see this other hand-blown glass that's kind of more of like a tulip shape. Um, the theory here is that the alcohol kind of, you know, goes in and then it expands out to kind of get, get it in your nose and your mouth. Um, when you're doing organoleptic tastings, you're gonna realize how so much, I mean, I'm, this is kind of maybe cliche now, but so much of the taste comes from the nose. And I, I guess I never really uh, realized it until I was like doing um, tastings with intent. So it's kind of crazy with all of the flavors you're gonna get like in your nose. And then, and you might go to taste it. And there's, there's like, maybe like uh, just a few things you might taste. Like you might, you might smell like, 20 or 30 different things in the Ricea, but you might taste only a few. Now, when you're judging quality of Ricea or any other agave spirit, you want to, on, on the tongue, in your mouth, you want to, when a Ricea is really, really good, it's going like, to have equal the amount of smells um, as tastes. Like, uh, it's going to be very complex on the mouth, just like it is on the nose. Um, something famous in 
uh, Chocolo and Ricea is these bullhorns. I'd imagine tequila was probably drank with these bullhorns as well. I believe I even took this photo um, in tequila. Um, this is a, a horn made from marble, I believe. Um, but you know, the, the real thing is made from the bull's horn. And uh, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty common here, especially in the south of Jalisco. I want to give you guys some cocktail ideas as well with Ricea. Um, we have a michelada. And just, just dump a shot of Ricea in your michelada. Uh, it was crazy how good this was. Um, I didn't want to get too detailed with the cocktail ideas. Uh, there's so many different kinds. Um, but we have a Ricea mojito. Um, if you come to Puerto Vallarta, there's a place called Barracuda, which makes like a, a kind of Ricea mojito, but they call it a Barracuda. Um, the, their restaurant is on the beach over here and their uh, Ricea cocktail is absolutely delicious. Um, so I put the Ricea mojito there. Um, and then I put a Ricea margarita is also equally delicious. I wanted to highlight some brands that possibly are available in the United States. If not, you're probably gonna see them pretty soon. Um, I know La Venenosa has distribution, <coughs> sorry guys, um, in, the major, uh, in the, like the major metro areas, probably Chicago, California, New York, Texas, things like that, maybe Florida. Um, they also distribute for Lobo de la Sierra. Um, they don't, I, I, I don't believe they use all of his expressions. I think Lobo also distributes his own Ricea. I'm not even sure if he's actually certified under the denomination of origin. Um, but he, he, he calls his, um, his Ricea either Vino de Mezcal or, or Vino, de, Vino de Cerro, Vino of the Mountains. Um, there's a newer brand called Bonete, which is a type of tree. Um, this type of tree is used for the Filipinos still, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this guy distributes for Don Gelo or Luis, um, and then a producer on the coast. Um, we have Mezonte, which is kind of getting pretty famous right now um, in the United States from what I, I can see. Both La Venenosa and Mezonte have showrooms or um, cantinas in Guadalajara, and you can make a reservation and they have like this whole library of agave spirits. It'll blow your mind. Um, Mezante, I believe, focuses mostly on Jalisco and, and La Venenosa as well. And, and it's going to blow your mind, like how many uh, variations of Ricea you're going to see or var variations of agave spirits, rather, you're going to see from Jalisco. I had no idea that many existed, but um, we also have Tesoro del Oeste, which I've mentioned several times earlier. Um, we have Las Perlas de Jalisco. Um, I believe these guys have distribution in the United States um, lightly. Um, Tesoro del Oeste, it sounds like he's looking um, for the right distributor right now. Um, I know he was in talks and, and visiting some, um, but you know, uh, he, he is definitely open for distribution in the United States, which is super cool. I'm totally rooting for all these guys. Um, La Reina. Uh, this is a really interesting brand. Not it, it, so. First of all, it, it's it's led by Raisiera um, and her husband. Um, they they kind of take the forefront, but they they do a really interesting concept with Raisiera, um, kind of like an experience. They they rent out like super cool places, and it's kind of like a more modern facing brand, like kind of like hipster, but. Um, it's super different what they're doing. And, uh, you know, you got to really appreciate the, the di diverseness across all these different brands. Now, we also have Dan Lalin. Um, this guy is absolutely hilarious. Same with Lobo de la Sierra. If you ever come to Puerto Vallarta, I would take a trip to meet, to meet any one of these guys. Um, but you're, you're really going to have a fun time if you, if you start talking with uh, Dan, uh, Dan Lalo at his uh, distillery, Don Lalin. All right. So we're gonna get into La Ruta de, de Raicía de la Sierra. So there's really two ways to do the Ruta de Raicía. You could do it from Guadalajara, 
which is kind of like all the way, I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse or not, but it's all the way to the right, even further on the map. So you could take Guadalajara and basically drive all the way to Puerto Vallarta and go Taberna hopping um, on your way. Um, the drive is about six hours total um, without stopping. So imagine if you are making stops, it's gonna be um, somewhere between 10 and 12 hours. Um, it's very mountainous in this region. And you, you don't typically wanna drive at night just because it is so mountainous and there's a lot of, especially during rainy season, there's a lot of washouts and things like that. So I would recommend driving during the day. You could also do the La Ruta de Raicia, de Puerto Vallarta, from Puerto Vallarta, come up through the, the main highway here. Um, you're gonna go to La Estancia, you're gonna hit two or three tabernas there. You're gonna go to San Sebastian del Oeste, to see Sergio. Um, and then you're gonna travel through Mascota. You could hit Lobo here. Um, and also all the way to Antonguil to see La Reina. Um, but there's also several other like uh, lesser known um, tabernas in between. So guys, this kind of concludes my presentation. I'm going to um, unshare my screen now and open things up for questions. Um, I just wanted to mention with Mescal for Life, be on the lookout for a podcast. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of interviews with a bunch of different ricieros. We're going to do a whole, um, like a whole, uh, like three or four episodes with different ricieros. And uh, it should be super cool to highlight ricea as we're doing now because it's kind of a lesser known thing. So it's awesome to just keep generating awareness about it. Um, also, if you're coming to Puerto Vallarta, Guadalajara, um, give me a call. My contact information, my email is on the bottom there. Um, we could we could arrange a private tour for you. Um, and yeah, my name on Facebook is Greg John Redkowski, and you could also find me on TikTok at Greg Agave. So I just wanted to thank you all for coming. And this is me with Lobo. He's probably looking at me crazy because I have my wine glass. Um, but yeah, I had, a, I had a great time at his distillery. So thank you guys again. I'm going to open up this for questions here. <laughs>